wisdom of the ego, the natural history of alcoholism revisited, and his most recent book is Aging Well. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Valent. Good afternoon. I'm sorry to get in the way of your completing a leisurely um, lunch. It's a great honor to be here. I do need to uh, tell you that I've not seized Alan Marlott's job, as the program suggests. And my name is pronounced like the old automobile, Valiant, even though it's not spelled that way. Today, my task is to link three hungers. Addiction to alcohol, positive emotion, and spirituality. In one sentence, my lecture can be summed up as honey, show do, catch, mo flies, then vinegar. In Latin, that translates into Carl Jung's Spiritus Contra Spiritu. Spirituality and emotions are the same thing. And since they are both dopaminergic and limbic, only they, and not the science of the enlightenment, can cure addiction. First, let me link spirituality and positive emotions. Our spirituality is made up of positive emotions. Unlike religious cognitions, dogma and belief systems, and unlike negative emotions, the positive emotions help us to broaden and build. They're very different from sorrow, guilt, anger, and fear, in that one, they are not all about me, and second, they are not focused on time present, but on time future. That's why the positive emotions are so important in learning and personal growth. Every recovering alcoholic knows that resentments, the poor me's, and fear are the enemies of recovery. While the so-called theological virtues, faith, hope, love, forgiveness, compassion, are what spirituality and recovery from addiction are all about. The slide contains what is often called the 11th step prayer from AA. And of course, the last great positive emotion Comfort, otherwise known as compassion, is at the root of the 12th step. Academics, especially psychologists and psychiatrists, are frightened of the positive emotions. For example, Sadoc and Sadoc, the leading American textbook of psychiatry, devotes hundreds of lines to anger, to shame, to terrorism, to hate, to sin, to guilt, and of course thousands of lines to anxiety and depression. Although half a million lines in length, the book devotes five lines to hope, one line to joy, and not a single line to love, faith, forgiveness, gratitude, or compassion. The three leading psychology departments with which I've been associated, Stanford, Harvard, and Dartmouth, have all avoided having clinical programs. God forbid that they muddy their science with attachment and compassion. But in leaning over backwards to avoid hope, Academics avoid the perfectly scientific positive emotions. So what makes positive emotions so aversive to science? 
Irrational superstition may be a good place to start. You see, scientists, too, are susceptible to hope. In contrast, the world's great religions all give these emotions pride of place. How can we integrate spirituality and science to maximize our powers to heal? A major obstacle for the modern world to take spirituality seriously has been disillusion over false spiritual cures. Paradoxically, healing others and being healed is so very scientific and so very spiritual and sometimes, if you'll excuse my French, so full of bullshit. We so badly want for compassion to affect healing that the resulting backlash when spirituality fails to cure makes many cynical. Always the power of positive emotions, like faith, hope, and love, must be separated from the false comfort of wish, denial, and hope. The multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical industry on television, the multi-billion dollar alternative medicine industry in your local pharmacy, the multi-million dollar get thin quick industry in your local bookstore, and the thousands of alternative healers in the yellow pages all spawn millions of believers in cures that depend upon despair, denial, gullibility, and marketing, rather than upon love, reason, and most important for this lecture, upon long-term follow-up. In short, the critical issue of spiritual healing is how do we distinguish scientific truth from wishful illusion? How can those who need help find comfort in places that are empathic and safe, not cultish, exploitative, or even delusional? The pleadings of some lovers reflect unselfish love, and the pleadings of other lovers reflect reptilian lust. And how are we to tell? Only by what my children used to call wait and see pie. Only by their fruits shall you know them. And this is why today I'm talking about a 65-year perspective study. Despite the great power of the so-called theological virtues against suffering, they exert very limited effect upon disease. Interpersonal relief of suffering is the domain of the positive emotions. Pharmacological and surgical relief of pain is the domain of science. Of course, for the patient suffering from low back pain, the value of hugs, lure, chiropractic, valium, and spinal surgery are all intertwined and of roughly equal value. But the question that I'm addressing today is, can spirituality ever cure? A friend of mine once told me that she hated the word spirituality because of the hope that went with it. I asked her to define hope. She defined it as the promise of cure, never delivered. Spirituality often becomes hope when we try to explain its effects too concretely or overcharged for our services or confuse comfort with healing or believe without adequate follow-up that a caprosate and naltrexone cure alcoholics. For some of us, using spirituality for subjective well-being can seem narcissistic. Images of spiritual yuppies engaging in aromatherapy and body wraps, and of valley girls using yoga to make a serious commitment to their abdomens comes to mind. In addition, spirituality and spiritual healing are often associated with cults and with totalitarian government. What would be a model 
of spiritual healing without side effects. In short, when is faith healing safe and when is it hope? Or if I'm to frame my question in empirical scientific terms, how can we enhance the healing potential of the positive emotions while minimizing the toxic effects of hope? As the focus for this discussion, I believe that the healing provided by Alcoholics Anonymous allows us to excavate the nature of what is meant by spiritual cure. No, I'm not an alcoholic, and I'm not a member of AA. But for 35 years as a clinician and as a research scientist, I've marveled at how alcoholics, by giving Samaritan comfort to each other, and by focusing daily on a power greater than me, are able to heal each other. In the United States, alcoholism kills 100,000 people a year. That's far more than die of breast cancer. However, professional medicine can do little to halt alcoholism over the long term. Modern medicine can detoxify alcoholics and over the short term save lives. And for a few months, modern medicines can delay relapse. Eventually, however, all too often, alcoholics treated by modern medical science relapse. In contrast, within the spiritual setting of alcoholics helping each other, AA provides an example of spirituality as a force that cures as well as comforts. I'm talking here about 20-year cures, not six months drying out and the brief efficacy of naltrexone and antibus. Often AA is referred to as a self-help group. Nothing could be further from the truth. Self-help is very limited. We all know that doctors who try to care for themselves have fools for physicians. Best-selling books on self-help are well-intentioned, but more often than not, they're ineffectual. When did you last read a diet book that kept someone thin for five years? Elizabeth Taylor would like to know. Why so seldom? Because such books depend upon wish, not upon human communion. Self-help is all about me. Wishes and self-help books are autistic and isolate us. If you can't even tickle yourself, how are you going to give yourself love? In sharp contrast, most of the incorrectly named self-help groups like AA are as communal as a barn raiser. If I'm to justify my thesis that AA provides a tangible model for understanding spiritual healing, I must provide scientific facts and not rhetoric. If I'm to suggest that a program based on dependence on a higher power is more like penicillin than it is like the Mooney's Unification Church, I must respect the rules of experimental medicine. I must present a mechanism of action. I must present efficacy better than placebo. And I must examine toxic side effects. First, Alcoholics Anonymous does cure, if AA cures alcoholism, what's its mechanism of action? Much of what has been done scientifically to cure alcoholism is at best placebo and at worst hope. For example, cure from addiction does not come through psychodynamic insight. In my own prospective study of Harvard graduates, 26 alcoholics received 5,000 hours of psychotherapy. Only run, one recovered while in psychotherapy, and I say this as a dedicated psychotherapist. Nor is life-saving detoxification effective for very long. In one study, being on the waiting list was about as successful as four comparable treatment studies. In addition, cognitive behavior therapy works less well than we would like. 
Linda and Mark Sobel's famous 1970 study of training alcoholics to return to social drinking won them worldwide fame until someone thought to do a 10-year follow-up study and found that the treated patients fared no better than the untreated. Even Bill Miller, who you heard talked about in Scott Tonigan's uh, talk, who's a brilliant investigator, found at eight years that his patients turned out to do better in AA, not intended to be a controlled study, than they had in CBT. The reason for this failure is twofold. First, the hold that drug addiction has on human beings doesn't rest in our neocortex. The hold that addiction has on our minds rests in what's been called our reptile brain. The hold comes from cellular changes in midbrain nuclei with esoteric names like the nucleus accumbens, which will keep cropping up, and the superior tegmenta. Eventually, these changes move abstinence beyond the reach of willpower, which doesn't predict remission, by the way, beyond the reach of conditioning, and beyond the reach of psychoanalytic insight, and beyond the reach of deep fidelity to God. Catholic priests need AA just as badly as the rest of us to recover from alcoholism. The second reason the professional treatment fails to prevent relapse in alcoholism are the skills needed to climb out of a hole are different from the skills needed to fall into it. What the slide shows are the six major reasons why people become alcoholic. None of these predictors are associated with recovery. Change in clinical course in both alcoholism and diabetes can be obtained not from doctors, but from relapse prevention. And to quote Lady Macbeth's physician, therein the patient must minister to herself. There are four factors commonly present in relapse prevention, from smoking, from gambling, from heroin addiction, and alcoholism. The four factors all prevent relapse. And briefly, they're external supervision, ritualized dependency on a competing behavior, new love relationships, and deepened spirituality. Usually, we observe that two or more of these had to be present for alcoholism to remit. Recovery from alcoholism like recovery from two-pack-a-day smoking is anything but spontaneous. The reason that these four factors are effective is because unlike most of our professional treatment, they don't work to create temporary abstinence. They work to prevent relapse. First, external supervision is necessary because alligators don't come when they're called. Some kind of leash is needed to control the reptile brain. In our neocortex, most of us know we ought to exercise more often, but we still take elevators. The great Christian theologian, Paul Tillich, wrote brilliantly about unselfish love, but he couldn't control his own repeated infidelity to his wife. AA, religion, and most personal trainers provide external supervision. They simply don't trust free will. They suggest that their clients return again and again. In AA, members are encouraged to find a sponsor to telephone and visit often. They're encouraged to keep coming back, and they're encouraged to engage in service to other alcoholics. Each of these activities serve to keep the memory green. But AA also understands that compulsory supervision works best if it's from choice. Honey, show does catch more flies than vinegar. We willingly suffer under the strict rules of our coach. 
where we may avoid the rules of some authoritarian tax collector or traffic policeman. Secondly, it's important to find a substitute dependency or a competing reinforcer for addiction. You can't easily give up a habit without getting, quotes, addicted to something else. AA understands what all behaviorists know, and parents and psychiatrists and priests often forget. Bad habits need substitutes, not threats. Punishments and negative emotion alone don't change deeply ingrained habits. Thus, AA and most religions provide a gratifying schedule of social and service activities in the presence of supportive and now healed former sinners, especially at times of high risk like holidays. Think of all the times on a weekend or a holiday when you could get nothing but your doctor's answering service, where spiritual organizations on weekends are open for business. AA home groups, more than most religions, focus on fostering positive emotions, an attitude of gratitude. To keep it, you have to give it away. Ritual criticism is replaced by, quotes, loving suggestions and unconditional positive regard. AA meetings are filled with laughter, celebrations, anniversaries for sobriety, and unlimited coffee and hugs. And remember, humor is another positive emotion, not on the St. Francis prayer. And of course, AA meetings compete with prime drinking time. The bad news is that critics sometimes complain that AA is as addicting as alcohol. But so are puppies. Like heroin, Positive emotion has a sneaky way of making us want to come back for more. The unhealthy pleasure of chemical addiction is replaced by the healthy, physiological, dopaminergic neurobiology of the positive emotions. Another substitute for alcohol supplied by AA is the positive emotion of forgiveness. Alcoholics have often inflicted enormous pain and injury on others. Thus, when sober, alcoholics may experience overwhelming guilt. Now, alcohol is a worthless, worse than worthless antidepressant. It's not much good in anxiety, but alcohol is the best drug against guilt that we have in our pharmacopoeia. And thus, AA, by providing absolution from a power greater than ourselves, and by fellow alcoholics who are about the only people who can forgive alcoholics' behavior when drinking, is an enormous, important reinforcer. Third, new love relationships. New love relationships are important to recovery. It seems important for ex-addicts to bond with people who they have not hurt severely in the past and thus are chronically, if covertly, furious at them, and to whom they are not deeply emotionally in debt. Indeed, it helps for alcoholics to bond with people who they can provide with compassionate help. Perhaps it's no accident that the maternal infant bonding is mediated by endorphin, our brain's natural morphine. The next speaker will tell you more about that. Love trumps drugs. Or as Cole Porter, that great student of the limbic system, explained to us, I get no kick from cocaine, I get a kick out of you, and I'd even give up coffee for Sanka. Even Sanka. Bianca, for you. As in evolution, 
love can tame the reptile brain. In short, compassion and love are even more consoling than shopping and chocolate, but just as addicting. AA calls such a forgiving fellowship the language of the heart. But what I'm really asking you to distinguish here is Paul McLean's triune brain, where you have the midbrain, the reptile brain, devoted to the four Fs of the hypothalamus. Fear, fight, feeding, and sending valentines. And the neocortex, which is all about words and ideas. But what separated our mammalian ancestors from the dinosaurs was their ability to care for their young, to play, to love unselfishly, and to have faith that if you cried out, your mother would rescue you, not gobble you up. The fourth common feature in recovery from addiction is the discovery or rediscovery of spirituality. Inspirational, altruistic group membership and belief in a power greater than me seems important to recovery from addiction. This has been identified first by William James, later by Jung with his Spiritus Contra Spiritu. The 12th step of AA carries the same message as Lord. To keep it, you have to give it away. That makes no sense to a human neocortex, but it makes excellent sense to the mammalian limbic system, which has evolved in order to provide unselfish love. In short, human attachment and spirituality are mediated by the tracks, dopaminergic tracks in the limbic system and provide worthy substitutes for drugs. Since it's doubtful that our preliterate ancestors shot dope, the limbic brain circuitry underlying addiction may have evolved to facilitate unselfish love, attachment, social cohesion, and spiritual community. One mechanism that helps spirituality to combat addiction may be that both spirituality and religion provide an alternative to the subjective high produced by drugs. In the 19th century, when opium smoking was a luxury of the rich, Karl Marx quipped that the opiates, I mean that religion was the opiates of the masses. But let's turn old Karl Marx on his head. Maybe the sense of spiritual peace and oceanic high that the masses receive from meditation, prayer, and daily readings was the real thing. And the joy experienced by De Quincey and Coleridge and their pals was merely ersatz. Put in more scientific terms, spirituality is maybe an indirect way we have of stimulating both our dopaminergic and our endorphin systems. Consider the phenomenon at the height of battle. There are two related phenomena. One, not only are there no atheists in foxholes, but often in battle, the severely wounded feel no pain. To quote William James, spiritual experiences could become objective reality. Some through sudden, brilliant illuminations, but nearly all had the common denominator of pain, suffering, and calamity. God comes in through the wound. Let me carry this hypothesis a little bit further. Dopaminergic brain tracks 
can be shown to underlie addictive behavior in mammals and reptiles. A scientist can produce pleasure in the brain by inserting dopamine into the primitive circuitry that links the nucleus accumbens and the superior tegmeta. But in mammals, these same dopaminergic tracts run from the midbrain through the limbic system, that part of the mammalian brain that serves attachment, onto the anterior cingulate gyrus that also supports attachment, and to the frontal lobe that lights up when a mother sees a newborn child. Or in the words of Thomas Insull, the present director of NIMH, 10 minutes. It's also possible that neural mechanisms that we associate with drug abuse and addiction might have evolved for social recognition, reward, and euphoria, critical elements in the process of attachment, unquote. I'm going to race through the um, rest of this, and you just have to uh, forgive me. After suggesting the mechanism of action, does it really work? Can you still hear me if I'm away from the mic? OK. Um, it's all right. Uh, don't worry about it. Um, first, pooling data shows that leading groups, having a sponsor, going to meetings, helps relapse prevention. But the argument is then made, well, maybe people who go to meetings are just those people that comply with treatment of all kinds, and what you're getting here is compliance. So at Stanford, uh, Rudy Moose and his colleagues did a study for eight years of comparing AA visits with clinic visits. At the end of eight years, clinic visits correlated weekly with outcome. AA visits correlated strongly with outcome. And if you went to AA and to clinic, you were twice as likely to remain abstinent as if you just went to clinic. Here you have a 20-year uh, study of alcoholics, which is a chronic disease, who averaged 20 years whether of addiction, whether they recovered or not. One group has been abstinent for an average of 20 years. The other group kept on drinking till they died. And the important difference in the slide, for those of you that can't see it, is that the alcoholics who recovered attended 30 times, you don't need statistics for that, 30 times more AA meetings than the ones who failed to recover. OK. So it works. But what about all of these toxic effects? The emotional language and the rhetoric of AA horrifies social scientists and journalists. They just love it when someone goes back to social drinking. How do you get around that? Now, cults and AA both take advantage of the fact that people achieve relief from emotional distress when they feel held by what Mark Galander calls a social cocoon. But healing through a tense affiliation is hardly confined to cults. Families, sororities, and soccer teams also provide cocoons. Galander is quite right in accusing AA of a high level of social cohesion. And it's true, besides recovery and service, the third cornerstone of AA membership is unity. But the dogmatic unity of AA is based on the same principles that drove the 13 original American states to achieve social cohesion. In Ben Franklin's words, if we don't all hang together, we'll hang separately. 
Unlike membership in a cult, following the rigid sequential rules of AA is like following a Nautilus program provided by your cardiac rehabilitation doctor. There's many steps at the top of the mountain. The 12 steps is just one of them. But if you don't follow an exercise sequence, quotes religiously, unquote, we often let things slide. Nor is AA a religion. And there's several ways that AA has avoided becoming a religion. First place, the spiritual foundation on which AA arose was based on the fact that James Jung and Dr. Bob all hated organized religion, but were all deep students of what religions had in common in order to heal. Another difference is that unlike some religions like Jehovah's Witness and Christian Science, AA explicitly says, quotes, no AA member plays doctor, close quotes. Quotes, it is wrong to deprive any alcoholic of medication which can alleviate or control other disabling physical or emotional problems. It's true that some sponsors ignore that, but then Paul Tillich ignored the commandment that forbade adultery. Again, it's hard to belong to two religions at the same time. But in Hindu India, in Buddhist Japan, in passionately Catholic Spain, AA membership has increased tenfold in the last 15 years. Third, AA has tried to avoid black and white thinking, except with regard to abstinence and public anonymity. In the words of co-founder Bob Smith, the famous 12 steps are, quote, suggestions, not dogma. And he could reduce the 12 steps of AA to just three words, quotes, love and service, close quotes. Another major difference between AA and religion is that AA has avoided authority. Most jobs are unpaid. Rotation is a very strict rule, so no one accumulates authority. And in that way, AA is much like the early Christian church, which was for a brief century free of past rabbinical authority and free of future papal authority. Another feature that AA has that distinguishes it from any cult of which I know, and most religions, including my own faith tradition of psychoanalysis, is that AA has a sense of humor. And humor, by the way, is partially located in the nucleus accumbens. Every meeting of AA that I've ever attended has been filled with laughter. Cults, bishops, and training analysts often fail to observe AA's venerable rule number 62. Don't take yourself too damn seriously. And it's equally important to note the other 61 rules don't exist. Finally, AA, like the Franciscans, strives to stay poor. AA has no property. Outside people can't give money to AA, and AA members can only leave AA $2,000 in their wills. Wish we could do that with political parties. Two minutes. Remember, not only do the positive emotions reflect spirituality, the positive emotions are never all about me. Nevertheless, skeptical academic minds 
have tended not to accept the universal importance of spirituality in human life. They've wished to keep scientific and spiritual truths separate, insisting that scientific is truer than spiritual. I believe that's a mistake, and sociobiologist E.O. Wilson comes to my rescue. Quote, the essence of humanity's spiritual dilemma is that we evolved genetically to accept one truth and discovered another. With the printing press and then the Enlightenment, limbic, positive emotion became subordinate to lexical neocortical science and dogma. However, as the French discovered with their atheistic but very scientific guillotine, the Enlightenment was sometimes too true to be good. Hunter-gatherer humanity evolved to accept the truth that the highest values of humanity could be expressed through enduring spiritual metaphors and through the enduring guidance of positive emotions. The science that humanity has discovered has evolved the rapid evolution and transmission of culture in order to validate, and when necessary, to invalidate the perceptions of our five senses. But the difference between neocortical science and limbic spirituality isn't there. They both mediate survival. They simply depend on different parts of our highly integrated, if haphazardly evolved, brain. One truth isn't truer than another. Thanks for listening.